Luke 22, this is talking about before Jesus died on the cross, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and here's what it says in Luke 22. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, and that's an important word there, agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer and had come to the disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who is called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. The word, we see that Jesus was in agony, and that word is the word agonia in the Greek, and it means great fear or distress. And we need to understand that Jesus experienced fear, but he defeated it. And because Jesus defeated it, we can also defeat it. And it literally, he shows us how to do it. Let me, let me say one other thing before I get into the body of the message. And that is, every time you make a fear-based decision, it will never be in compliance to God's will. And I'll say this, I'll promise you, you'll regret every fear-based decision that you'll ever make in life. And Satan puts fear on us. See, it was God's will for Jesus to go to the cross. And Jesus prays three times and says, Father, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Not my will, your will be done. And the answer is God says, you're going to do this. And so Jesus was dealing with the temptation not to do it because of the fear that he was feeling. But thank God that we have a savior because he acted above his fears. And he'll have disciples if we act above ours. But fear is always present, always there in our lives to some degree to try to keep us from doing God's will. And understand, our concept of God is, is, is huge. You cannot get closer to God than your concept of him will allow. If you believe that God is a loving, sweet, generous daddy, when you have a problem, you will run toward that God. If you believe that God is a mean, austere, distant, troubled God, you will not run toward that God when you're in trouble. God's throne is a throne of grace. And our high priest who is on that throne understands every single thing we go through. When you need God the most, you deserve him the least. The reason we need him is we're a mess. And the only way to get fixed up is jump in his lap. But you're not going to run toward him. In other words, if you're feeling fear, if you're feeling weakness, if you're feeling insecurity, those kinds of things, and you fear, he, he, here's, here's what the devil wants you to believe. God's already kind of ticked at you. Just don't get too close to him or he'll swat you. He sees all the dumb stuff you do, and he just doesn't want you hanging around him too much. He'll take you in the family, but stay at the back of the line. The devil wants you to believe that God's always kind of mad at you, and he really doesn't like you. That's the concept of God the devil wants you to have. Your high priest is madly in love with you, and when you go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I'm tempted, I'm feeling sexual temptation, I'm feeling financial temptation. I'm, I'm feeling tempted to do something bad, and I'm feeling fearful. Jesus says this, I experienced that. I know exactly what you're feeling. Let me help you overcome it. Let me say this. If, if you could see God how he really is, you would run toward him, and you'd never feel fear again. He is madly in love with you. He understands not just your issues, but why you have those issues. And he wants you to come to him and let him mercifully and graciously help you. Jesus said, I'm humble and gentle. And you'll find rest for your souls in my presence. Our God is a fabulous God. And our God understands everything we've gone through. Every fear, every temptation. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus felt fear here. Is so he could identify with us. The second reason that Jesus felt fear. Was because he had the full knowledge of everything he was about to go through. Remember, he was also fully God. He knew everything. Now, see, all fears ultimately are the fear of death. You, you say, well, I have a fear of bugs. No, you don't. You have a fear of getting bitten and dying of a bug, a critter. Okay, you say, well, I have the fear of snakes. You do not have the fear of snakes. You have the fear of dying by snake bite. You, have a fear of, you say, I have a fear of heights. You do not have a fear of heights. You have a fear of splattering. Okay, so... 
If you think through all your fears, they ultimately come to the fear of death. But let me, let me say something to you about this. You'll never die. That, that's the lie of the fear of death. It says that Satan holds people in bondage because of the fear of death. You'll never die. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Well, let me, let me say this to you. Do you understand that you will never in all of eternity experience a moment of death? You'll never be in a casket in the ground. You never will be. Your body will be. And one day your body will be reunited with your spirit. But do you understand the instant that your eyes close on earth, they open in heaven? Jesus turned to the thief on the cross next to him and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Isn't that what he said? The minute that you go numb here, your senses come alive there. The instant you take your last breath here, you take your first breath there. Somebody say amen. amen. You'll never die. You'll never die. So when the devil comes and tries to put the fear of death on you or some fear on you, see, fear is a prophet spirit from hell to give us a negative view of the future to cause us to make a fear-based decision that God will not honor. Faith is from the Spirit of God to give us a positive view of the future so we'll make a faith-based decision that God will honor. Yeah. Satan's always dogging you through fear. He's always showing you a movie of the future, of your husband, of your wife, of your children, of your health, of your finances to get you upset so you will find a reason not to do what God is saying. But faith gives you courage. Thank God that we have a Savior because he acted above his fear. Jesus felt fear, but he didn't let it control him. He acted above it. Here, here's why the, the, the devil uses fear and kind of the nature of fear. Now, there's some good fear. I mean, like, for example, someone swerves into your lane when you're driving, and you feel uh, instantly that fear. Uh, that's a good kind of a fear. But the fear I'm talking about is a demonic kind of a paralyzing fear. And here's the difference between good fear and bad fear and how, how you can tell the difference. Good fear is circumstantial. I only, I only feel that fear someone swerves into my lane because there's somebody in my lane. When they pass, I'm over it. Bad fear is perpetual. It, it, just, it just hangs over you. Just that sense that the next shoe is going to drop. Anybody ever had that before? You just you had so much hurt, you had so much pain, you had so many bad things happen. There's just that perpetual fear that the next shoe is about to drop. Listen, listen, fear is expecting the devil to move. Faith is expecting God to move. Huh? And we choose. You can put your eyes on the devil or your eyes on God. Good fear is protective. Bad fear is paralyzing. Someone swerves into your lane, you swerve out. Good fear is instructive. Bad fear is confusing and fatalistic. When you're under the influence of, of good fear, you do the right thing. And this is the last one. Good fear is empowering. Bad fear is enslaving. There was a story in the news about a month ago of two like 20-year-old young ladies who lifted a truck off their father. He was pinned under a truck. I don't know if you saw that story, but these two young girls come over and grab this truck and lift it off their father. Their father crawls out, and they came up to these girls and said, how do you do that? They said, we don't know. <laughs> you can do superhuman things when you're under the adrenaline of good fear, but bad fear is just enslaving. You need to understand this about you can only give away what you have. The devil only has fear. The Bible says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. One of the things that happens when you reject God is he takes away peace. Listen, God owns peace. It's his property. The devil doesn't have any peace. That's why people who are in rebellion to God, they have to try to buy it in a bottle or, a, or something like that. They can't get it. The devil has no peace. He's full of fear. It's how he thinks, it's how he feels. As much as you know the presence of God by peace, you know the presence of the devil by fear. You need to change your mind about fear. When fear shows up, it doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the devil's trying to influence you to get you to do the wrong thing so that you won't follow God, that you won't be the person that God wants you to be. That's the why he comes. Jesus rules by peace because he's full of it. The devil rules by fear because he's full of it. That's the way he influences us in our lives. And here's how to overcome fear. Like Jesus, the number one thing to do is to admit your fear without shame. Don't be ashamed of it. We all feel it. 
though, though we sometimes want to act like we don't, we do. God is a God of light, and the devil is a devil of darkness. See, when the devil is working, he always puts shame and fear on something, so we won't admit it. We don't want to talk about it. But it won't be well until you bring it into the light. And here's, here's what Jesus said. Daddy, I'm afraid. The Son of God went before his Father and said, Abba, Father, Daddy, I don't want to do this. I'm afraid. The truth literally will make you free. And the, the end of fear is when we expose it as an entity, not as something that is natural within us, but something that is supernatural and from the devil. This is a spirit of fear. Daddy, I'm afraid, and I know that this doesn't come from you because the Bible says that you would not give me a spirit of fear. The second thing that you do to overcome fear is that you submit your fears to God. You have to submit it to God. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. You go to God and you say, you say Lord, I, I feel fear right now. I want you to listen to me. Is that Mark, I love what Mark Twain said. He said, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the mastery of it. People who've died for our nation, they felt fear. But they acted above their fears. To be a mature Christian, you have to act above your emotions. And there'll be many, many times in life when you're feeling anger and you have to act above it. You feel the desire for revenge. You feel a, a temptation for sexual immorality. You feel fear. And because of that fear, you don't want to do what God is saying. And to become a man and woman of God, you have to act above that. And here's what it means. You go to God and say, I'm feeling an emotion and it's real, but it doesn't mean it's right. And Jesus went to God the Father and said, Father, I'm afraid, but I don't want my will to be done. I want your will to be done. Now listen, good doctors don't operate on their children for a reason. And that's because emotion makes you less capable of making a good decision, right? The worst time to be making a decision is when you're feeling fear. That's when you need outside counsel. That's when you need somebody else telling you what to do. And the best person is God telling you what to do. The perspective that we have is so isolated. We, I have a perspective of right here, right now, in, in my past experiences, but I can't see everything else. God can see the entire world, everyone in it, and all of eternity. And I think he has the best perspective to help us make a good decision. And for that to happen, we have to separate how we feel from what's right and wrong. My emotions may be very real, but that does not mean that they're right. And it does not mean acting upon them will bring a good response. My greatest regret in life is every decision I made by fear. Great people feel fear, but great people act above it. To become the person that God wants you to be, you have to act, act above your fears. Now, let me say one more thing. I'm going to keep going here. When God took the children of Israel to the promised land, there were giants there. In fact, let me just start this next point. It's focus on God's presence and love is the third way that you deal with fear. The children of Israel came to the promised land. There were giants there, nine foot tall people. And the spies went into the land and they came out and 10 of the spies said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. These people are huge. They will destroy us if we go in there. But Joshua and Caleb came out and said, their protection has been lifted from them and they'll be our prey. Let's go in and take the land. Let me say this. The devil will always put a giant where God gives you the promise. And that giant's going to try to terrify you and keep you out of God's promised land. But once God gave you that land, that giant was pronounced dead right then. All you have to do is fight it. They could have shot a pea shooter at those giants and they would have died. Because God had lifted their protection from them. Now let me say this. What a blessing to move in after giants. Big houses, big beds, big closets, <laughs> big barns. You know, what a blessing. And so it's just the way you see things. And 10 spies came out and terrified the nation of Israel with a bad report. And two spies came out and said, we see a big God and a little devil. Let's go in and take our land. How big is your God? How big is your devil? Understand the devil is not omnipresent, but our God is. The universe cannot contain our God. 
But the devil is a creature. He is not omnipresent. How big is your God? And here's what David says in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's not the valley of the shadow of a hangnail. That's not the valley of the shadow of a headache. That's the valley of the shadow of death. And he says, I don't fear because you're with me. Here's the confession of Jesus on his way to the cross. When the devil was trying to terrify Jesus, this is his confession in Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in show, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. On the way to the cross, the devil was telling Jesus, you have disappointed your father. You're a huge failure. You're going to rot in hell, and God will not come get you. And Jesus said, he will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. He's not going to leave me in show. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. You will show me the path of life. And he is confessing against the devil, I have set the Lord always before me. Let me say this, the Lord's always before you. You might as well set, set, set your attention on him. Fear is reality minus God. Faith is reality plus God. If your eyes could be open right now to see the supernatural realm, you would never fear again. When I first started preaching about half a dozen times, little kids would sit out listening to me preach, and they'd draw pictures of me. And after the service, the mothers would come up and give me the pictures, and they were not flattering. I had to forgive those kids. And I remember all their names to this day. Anyway, but this is what happened about half a dozen times, which was so interesting. Different children at different times drew me preaching with two huge angels next to me. And the mothers, the first mother came and handed me that picture. I said, well, that, that's, that's sweet. And then six months later, another mother. A year later, another mother. Two years later, another mother. And these little kids, I guess in the spirit, could see something we can't see. Do you know that there are angels in here? <laughs> Hebrews 1 says that angels are ministering spirits sent to render aid to God's elect. There, there are angels in this place. And, and not only that, God is here. If our eyes could be open, we would never feel, feel fear again. But we have the choice to have spiritual eyes. That we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Even though I can't see him, I set the Lord always before me, therefore I will not be moved. The devil wants to overwhelm us with negative circumstances, so we'll run the other way. But we can choose by faith to set God before us. I want you to change your mind about fear. Well, I hope this program today is a blessing to you. And this program is talking about changing our mind about fear. You know, fear is so insidious. We all deal with it. Um, and it's of the devil. God doesn't use fear to control us. It's of the devil. And it always causes us to do the exact thing that will cause our fears to come true. Let me, let me give you an example of this. When Karen and I got married, we, we were broke. I mean, we were broker than broke. And I made $7,000 uh, the first several years we were married. My entire income was $7,000. We, we lived hand to mouth. I mean, we lived in government housing because that's, what, that's all we could afford was government-sponsored housing. And so we went to church one day. We were a young couple, young believers, and I made about $600 a month. And we go to this church, and the preacher's preaching on giving. And you know, I, I just, first of all, it just made me sick. And... I thought, I'll never come back to this church again. And, and, uh, and I, I, I couldn't imagine the concept of me giving money away to anybody. I needed more, not less. Uh, we got home. We, we went home from church that day. And uh, I said, can you believe that preacher, you know, preaching on giving? And Karen said, I like this message. And she said, I'd like to give $40 to the church if I could. I, I mean, I, I had an out-of-body experience. I mean, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I just it just freaked me out. I, we, we, we didn't have $40. We didn't have $1. We had no discretionary income. And the only way we made it was float at the bank, writing a check and it not, you know, cashing immediately. We lived from paycheck to paycheck. And when she wanted to give that money, it was terror, fear. I just thought, we'll go broke. We can't give that kind of money. 
And, and so, you know, I knew what the preacher had said about, you know, God will bless you and all that kind of stuff. Well, Karen had faith. I had fear. We were broke. I had a, I had a poverty spirit. You know, my, my family, I didn't grow up in poverty, but I grew up next door to it. We didn't have much. We worked hard, and we just we got by. And I had a spirit of poverty literally controlling my life, and my financial decisions only furthered that poverty. And so when Karen said, let's start giving to the Lord, she had faith. And to, to give, I had total fear. And that fear would have kept me in the position I was in. And she gave that money. I said, okay, fine. I didn't, I didn't mean it. I didn't agree with giving it. But I said, okay, go ahead and give that money. Karen gave that money. And the next time I got paid is the first time ever since we had been married that we had extra money in our account. And I hadn't gotten a raise. We didn't get any extra money. Something supernaturally happened in our finances God blessed our finances. Now, this, that's 40 years ago. And I'm saying to this day, we give to the Lord and we see phenomenal blessing by faith, not by fear. If you let fear control you, it will always cause you to do what will make your fears come true. In your marriage, in your finances, in your children, the worst thing you can do is man, uh, raise your children based on fear. The worst thing you can do is manage your finances based on fear. There's these advertisements on TV all day long trying to send you into a panic, you know, concerning the economy or whatever. Be a person of faith. Be a person in your marriage, the way you talk, the way you act. Be a person of faith because God honors faith. Fear is a spirit to motivate us to do the wrong thing so God won't honor it, so our lives will, will be unsuccessful. God wants you to succeed, and for you to succeed, you got to change your mind about fear.